Most of us work hard for a living. We head out to work so that we can keep a roof over our heads, put food on our plates and enjoy some of the good things life has to offer. But there are some who will do whatever it takes to get their hands on what is not rightfully theirs. Our moment in crime is the Benson family murders. In the 1980s, Quail Creek was a brand new development of 50 extravagant mansions and community places for Florida's wealthy section of society. Located just 15 miles north of Naples, Quail Creek is a gated community that was once home to the heiress of the Lancaster Leaf and Tobacco Company, Margaret Benson. Opposite her home on White Violet Way was the Quail Creek Golf and Country Club, where, at 9.15am on the 9th of July 1985, two friends were enjoying a round of golf. From where they stood at the third tee, they could see a group of people making their way to a car parked on the driveway of Margaret Benson's home. The two golfers were expecting to continue with their round of golf. They were not expecting to be witnesses to a fatal explosion. On the death of her husband, Edward, in 1980, Margaret Benson and her children inherited around $400 million. She had two biological children, Carol, aged 40, and Stephen, aged 33. Then there was Scott, her 21-year-old adopted son, and the biological child of Carol. Both Carol and Stephen had already flown the nest when their father died. Carol lived in Boston and Stephen lived in Fort Myers, Florida. The Sunshine State was calling Margaret's name and she decided to put the family home in Lancaster, Pennsylvania up for sale and move south. She chose to buy a house in Quail Creek. The home was worth $600,000, had three bedrooms, two and a half bathrooms and stunning views across the golf course opposite. Those who knew the 63-year-old described her as low-key and a pleasant person. But one thing about the heiress always stuck with Robert Blyweiss, an electrician who had once worked on her Quail Creek property. He said, What impressed me most was that there wasn't an ashtray in the house. She owns a cigarette company and not an ashtray in the house. When Margaret's Lancaster home eventually sold for $475,000, her attorney in Philadelphia arranged to visit Margaret in Quail Creek so that the necessary paperwork could be signed and completed. The attorney was to stay in Margaret's home overnight and he would not be the only guest staying in the home that summer's day. Carol was visiting from Boston and with Scott still living with Margaret, his girlfriend was also a guest. Stephen made plans to visit his family on the 9th of July. He ran a home security system company called Security Network and would regularly use his mother's home as an office. With the work his company was getting in Quail Creek installing security systems, Stephen was thinking about purchasing an office in the area. That morning he drove the many miles from his home to the gated community his mother called home arriving at her property at 8am. Margaret, Carol and Scott intended to accompany Stephen on his trip to view business properties, but first came breakfast. Stephen volunteered to head out and buy coffee and donuts using Margaret's 1978 Chevrolet station wagon. Sources vary on how long Stephen was gone. Some say his trip did not take long, whereas others state that he was gone for around 70 minutes, with Stephen telling his family when he arrived back that he had bumped into an old acquaintance of his, whose name he conveniently could not remember. Scott was not really interested in viewing real estate that morning. He had arrived in Quail Creek to kill his family. Stephen's business was struggling. He would also spend money like there was no tomorrow. Despite knowing that his business was failing, he bought a house worth $235,000 after marrying for the second time. Rather than controlling his spending habits and funneling money into his company, he turned to Margaret for financial help. Stephen told his mother that he needed help meeting the payroll for his business. 
Margaret agreed to help out as she was also the co-owner of the business and gave her son several blank cheques. She thought that only a few thousand dollars would be needed. Instead, Stephen used the blank cheques to transfer two million dollars from her account into his own. With her trust betrayed, Margaret decided to take action. She stopped Stephen's spending allowance, asked her attorney to stop him from being a part of the company, and removed him from her will. Stephen, who was aware of all of this, decided to take revenge. Stephen planted two pipe bombs in his mother's car while he was out buying breakfast that July day. One was placed in the centre console between the driver and passenger seats, and the second was hidden under the rear seat. After eating breakfast, Margaret, Carol, Scott and Stephen headed out to the vehicle. The attorney and Scott's girlfriend had no intention of accompanying the family on their trip and stayed behind. Scott decided to drive and Margaret climbed into the passenger seat. Carol opened one of the rear doors. At that moment, Stephen claimed to have forgotten his tape measure and headed back inside. The first explosion happened when Scott turned on the ignition and as Carol was climbing into the back seat. Margaret and Scott died instantly and the force of the blast threw their bodies out of the car and onto the lawn. The two golfers who had witnessed the explosion ran over to help. Carol had been severely burned and was desperately trying to extinguish the flames burning her by rolling on the lawn. As the golfers reached the scene, the second bomb detonated. Metal fragments were thrown as far as 250 feet. One of the golfers was hit in the arm and chest by debris. Two groundskeepers working on the golf course rushed over to help the uninjured golfer pull Carol and his friend away from the burning vehicle. Stephen, who was standing next to the front door, was unscathed. This was all that was left of the vehicle. Carol's injuries were so serious that she had to be transferred to a burn centre in Boston by a Learjet equipped with intensive care equipment. She had no idea who wanted the Bensons dead. As far as she knew, there was no personal or business grievance that might cause someone to murder them. Stephen spoke to the press, saying he had no clue as to what the motive could be. The press ran with a story about Scott, reporting how he had been named in a paternity suit and held parties that lasted all night long. The police, however, ruled these rumours out as motives for the murders. Margaret and Scott were interred in the family mausoleum. Only relatives and close friends were allowed to attend the funeral and the police were there in order to observe the mourners. At first, the bombing completely baffled the authorities. But then the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place and justice came after Stephen Benson. All the evidence pointed to someone closely linked to the Bensons being the perpetrator. Scott was the owner of a guard dog who never gave any indication that something was wrong. The dog must have been familiar with anyone who had been near the vehicle that morning. Guards at the gated entrance to Quail Creek keep a logbook of visitors. Guests and service technicians had to be okayed by a telephone call to a resident before they were allowed into the community. A bomb expert said that the perpetrator wanted to make sure that everyone in the vehicle would be killed. And then came a report from a clerk at a building supplies store in Naples. Someone had purchased parts in that store similar to those used in the bombs. It was later determined that parts had been bought at two different stores by the same person on the 5th and 8th of July. The purchase had been made with cash and the customer's signature on a receipt was illegible. The customer was a tall and thick-set man in his 30s. He was wearing a baseball cap and glasses with dark lenses. At 6 foot 2 and 230 pounds, Stephen Benson matched the description. The police acted quickly. A warrant allowed investigators to obtain Stephen's fingerprints and handwriting samples. More evidence began to point straight at Stephen. 
Particles of powder from the bombs were found on his clothes. A left-hand palm print recovered from the store receipt matched Stephen's palm print. His fingerprints were found on one of the bomb parts. There was no denying that Stephen had tried to kill his entire family to make himself the sole heir of his mother's fortune. At 10am on the 22nd of August, Stephen was in the office of his attorney, Michael McDonnell, when he was arrested and charged with two counts of murder, one count of attempted murder and arson of a dwelling. Due to the amount of evidence present, it was determined that Stephen could be held for trial without bail. In the US, the use of explosives to commit murder is a federal offence. However, an agreement was made with the federal authorities. Stephen would be prosecuted in a state court as federal law did not have the death penalty. Stephen's trial began just days after the one year anniversary of the murders. His sister testified at the trial. Carol, who could not hold back her tears, told the court how Stephen had kept his back to her as she screamed for help after the explosion. Stephen never spoke at the trial, even sitting in silence when the verdict was announced. The jury, which was made up of 10 women and 2 men, deliberated for 11 hours and 44 minutes before reaching a guilty verdict. But the jury was not able to agree that Stephen should receive the death penalty, and as a result, the judge gave Stephen two life sentences for the murders and 22 years for attempted murder and arson of a dwelling. While incarcerated, Stephen was repeatedly transferred to different prisons because of the abuse and threats he received from other prisoners. He never gave an interview while behind bars. His last place of imprisonment was the Taylor Correctional Facility, where he died at the age of 63, just days before the 30th anniversary of the murders. When she heard about the news, Stephen's aunt, Janet Murphy, said that although she was surprised to hear about his death, she was not sad. Janet was quoted as saying, I'm not going to shed any tears. He was so evil.